Okay, wonderful. Yeah, so once again, thank you so much everyone for joining. And also, of course, thank you um, to all of our Facebook co-hosts, um, to One Payer States, to Our Revolution Connecticut, um, Western Connecticut uh, Democratic Socialists, We March uh, Connecticut, We March On, as well as um, Central Connecticut um, DSA. Thank you so much for spreading the word. And um, uh, yeah, um, tonight we have a very brief of what is Medicare for All Connecticut presentation followed by some action items very brief and then we're going to go right in into our guest speaker presentations with uh, Michael Leidy and Dr. Stephen Campbell. So um, let me see here how I can share my screen. Um, and in the meantime while I'm doing this everyone feel free to um, introduce yourself. So um, if you just want to write your name, your pronouns, um, the city you're in into the chat. So um, my name is Stefan Reimdorf, pronounce he, him. Um, progress. I'm the state in Florida. Florida. So, what? Let me. What, who, what's this about state of Florida? Um, I just said everybody can introduce themselves Great. in the chat, kind of like just writing name pronouns as well as, uh, for example, where one is from or like what's motivating you to attend the Medicare Fall meeting tonight. So, um, oh, I've already said mine. I, I've, I've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> Except that I live in Hamden, Connecticut, and I'm a um, senior citizen. So, um, let me share my screen. Or a little introduction to Medicare for Connecticut. All right. So uh, what is Medicare for All Connecticut? Um, Medicare for All Connecticut is an all volunteer grassroots group um, advocating for guaranteed health care for all. So um, recently we actually had the opportunity to incorporate. So now we're in incorporated with the state of Connecticut um, looking to apply for a 501c4 status. Um, this is a brief overview here of um, the Medicare for All Connecticut uh, board of directors as well as advisory panel members. Um, just some uh, background here, some of the organizations we already collaborated with, for example, in the recent successful Medicare for All resolution effort in New Hamden, sorry, uh, New Haven in New Haven. So um, yeah, just very briefly going over the, some of the past activities of Medicare for All Connecticut. Um, we did put on, for example, in 2018, an in-person statewide Medicare for All forum um, with about 150 attendees, so co-sponsor groups, panel of experts. Um, we did hand over um, nearly 17,000 signatures for Medicare for All to U.S. Senator Chris Murphy, um, asking him to actually co-sponsor the Medicare for All bill in the U.S. Senate. Um, members of Medicare for All Connecticut, including myself, were also present at the rollout of the Medicare for All bill in the U.S. House. Uh, back in 2019, we were down in Washington, D.C. Um, we did uh, reach out to the now U.S. rep from the 5th Congressional District of Connecticut, Johanna Hayes. Um, so we are delighted that um, she now is the first U.S. rep from the state of Connecticut um, co-sponsoring the Medicare for All legislation in the U.S. House. Um, then, of course, um, 2019, prior to the pandemic, we also still had our second Medicare for All Connecticut statewide meeting in Hamden. Uh, yeah, and then in 2020, uh, we were delighted that um, New London, actually, due to our efforts, community organizing, uh, became the first municipality in Connecticut to pass a Medicare for All resolution. Um, and because of the pandemic, we didn't have an in-person forum, but last year we did put on together with Public Citizen a virtual town hall. And actually our um, guest speaker amongst the panel of experts was also U.S. Senator Richard Blumenthal, who's a co-sponsor of the Medicare for All bill in the U.S. Senate at the same time. Um, hasn't been like really a vocal, very outspoken support yet. So we were delighted that um, he came onto the record during the Medicare for All virtual town hall last year. Um, for Medicare for All Connecticut in support of the policy as strongly as he had not really before. And also, um, yeah, due to activists out in the Villamantic uh, Windham area, 
um, amazing activism, like in January of this year, actually the Wyndham Town Council in Connecticut approved a resolution in support of Medicare for all. And um, in addition to that, this year also, we did have um, for the first time in many, many years in Connecticut, a state level single payer bill, um, which was introduced. So um, basically members of Medicare for all Connecticut, including myself, last year reached out to Connecticut state legislators asking who would like to introduce a bill that would guarantee all Connecticut residents guaranteed health care. Um, and yeah, we were delighted that there are legislators actually willing to do so. So in addition to the bill that would implement single payer, there was a second bill, the single payer study bill, which even passed the Connecticut uh, Human Services Committee this year, like after just having been introduced. Um, so uh, that was a huge organizing effort. Amazing to see all the support for single payer. Um, there was a public hearing. Everybody who spoke during that public hearing spoke in support of single payer. So that was on the state level this year. And um, then just recently last month in August, um, an incredible effort, the city of New Haven voted in favor of a resolution for Medicare for all. So um, yeah, this was after months of uh, canvassing, tabling, um, phone banking, incredible community outreach. So more than 500 letters were sent to the members of the Board of Alders, which then unanimously adopted the Medicare for All resolution. So if uh, in January somebody would have asked me, do you think Medicare for All um, a resolution could pass in New Haven? I'm not quite sure if I would have believed it, but, but incredible effort. and. Now New Haven is a third city in Connecticut with Medicare for All resolution. And I hope Camden will be the next one. Absolutely. Um, and so just very recently, um, also Medicare for All Connecticut was able to uh, collect letters in opposition to the proposed rate hike for the um, commercial insurers, their insurance policies offered for 2022 in the state of Connecticut. So. Um, uh, you know, one can still like see here on the website of the state of Connecticut all the um, emails, all the letters of testimony that were sent. So um, that was something that was recently um, an activity. Unfortunately, the rate hikes, um, I mean, they did kind of go through, but um, at the same time, not as high as originally proposed. So um, uh, yeah, finally, now uh, for the current actions, I wonder, um, Sivan, are you able to speak about the current actions? Yes, I'm just trying to make myself a co-host, but I don't think I can. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sivan. Um, I'm going to go over the... Uh, I'm in New Haven, sorry. Right. Make sure you feed him. Sorry, if everyone can mute themselves, if they're not speaking, that would be really helpful. Um, Anyway, uh, I'm going to go over the current actions that we have. Uh, so following on from what Stefan just said and what uh, I think her name Suzanne uh, was hoping for, um, we have a Hamden resolution similar to our other efforts um, such as New Haven as well as Willimantic uh, and New London. So if you live in uh, Hamden, um, it would be fantastic if you could fill out this, uh, cop, you know, click on this link I'm putting in the chat right now. Or if you do not live in Hampton, but know people who do, please send that to them. That will send a letter to the town council um, asking them to support uh, this resolution um, for Medicare for all at the local, state, and national level. Um, we also host phone bankings with our uh, fabulous advisory panel member, uh, Alana Irving. Um, and we also host canvassing with our other fabulous <laughs> um, board member Peter Cun Cunningham um, and basically each of those uh, both of those uh, will have full training provided scripts uh, information um, so even if you are not a 
uh, uh, pro at any of this, which you do not have to be at all. Um, it really helps to just spread the word this way um, through either phone banking or canvassing. Um, and you can sign up for those on our website, which is, I'm gonna put into the chat as well, medicareforallct.org. Um, and you can also sign up for the events, uh, the phone banking and canvassing on our Facebook. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So um, because we have now passed our resolution in New Haven, our next step is to try to uh, reach Rosa DeLauro, Representative Rosa DeLauro, who does not support Medicare for all. Um, we want her to hear the will of the people, to respond to it, and to um, take that lead. Uh, so our next um, action, uh, and this is for everybody in Connecticut, um, to please uh, letter to CT Congress follow this link I just put in the chat um, and fill out the uh, information. It's going to ask you for your title, so, sort of like uh, if you're Miss or Mr. or Doctor, um, and uh, what subject the the letter contains. So it would be health or healthcare or Medicare. Um, and then there's a template letter there um, that uh, asks, um, our uh, representatives, uh, Rosa DeLauro and our senators, Chris Murphy, um, he, he is not currently signed on, but Richard Blumenthal is, so it's good for him to see that, you know, we're, we're still fighting for this. Um, you can also uh, edit that letter um, as to make it as personal as you'd like it to be. Um, if you have a healthcare story, uh, if you know somebody who has a healthcare story, or even if you were affected by the pandemic um, th this past year, year and a half, um, and, and how uh, having the, our society having access to uh, medicine um, or, or even the vaccines, I mean, that's a form of Medicare for all, uh, Ha, you know, ha, uh, has impacted you. Um, so please follow that link as well. Um, and because we uh, at Medicare for All, oh, sorry, next slide, please. Uh, because we at Medicare for All support um, any uh, roads, any um, uh, ways to uh, uh, make universal single payer health care a reality in our towns and our uh, states in our in our country, uh, we are also supporting this act, which is um, uh, it, which was introduced uh, again to uh, to this Congress by California California Representative Ro Khanna, um, and already has twenty four co sponsors. So, what the difference between this state based universal health care um, and Medicare for all? Both of those, uh, um, each one's having you know capital letters being their own titles, uh, is that this would allow each state to um, uh, uh, administer their own form of Medicare for all instead of it being federal, uh, and then that. Uh, sort of trickling down, uh, this would be from the states going upwards. Um, and so uh, you can also um, let uh, your um, uh, congressional people know that you would support this as well, um, because this, this could actually um, jump up quite a few hurdles um, legislatively if this gets passed. And this is for the state-based uh, universal health care. And we will, of course, send all of these links out um, in follow-up emails. They'll also all be on our website um, and our, our social media. These are all there. Um, and then uh, very last but not least would be um, fundraising, asking people if you could open your hearts and minds to um, donating to our wonderful cause, we um, are a brand new organization and um, we are looking to um, become incorporated as a 501c4 organization later uh, this year, I think in December is when we plan on submitting our um, uh, 
our application um, and we will need uh, quite a bit of money for that. So if you could kindly donate to us um, and consider uh, monthly donations, if you can't donate monetarily, we would love if you would sign up to volunteer for any of those actions that were listed. Um, and we also have wonderful committees um, that you can join as well. Uh, those are all, and these are all listed on our website. Um, and uh, you, you would sign up for them on the website as well. Um, so should I go into what each of these are right now? Um, oh, that's up to you. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, legislative and electoral, basically if we would be working directly with um, legislators on all levels um, to create uh, policy to create law to create um, bills uh, that would go up in either the Connecticut um, uh, General Assembly or nationally. Um, and then we also on the electoral side would be working on finding candidates, supporting candidates who support Medicare for all to make sure that they get into office. Um, and so this is a really, this is a really exciting committee um, because you're actually, you know, doing the work um, the, uh, of, of getting this to the most amount of people. Um, the outreach committee uh, would be doing um, all of the uh, canvassing, phone banking, um, letter writing, uh, things like that, that would enable uh, us to spread the word as much as possible. Um, fundraising, pretty self-explanatory. If you have any expertise in that or a grant writing um, uh, 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 abilities, um, you know, please sign up for that um, because we want to make ourselves um, financially feasible as well. And then communications is actually our, probably our most successful. Uh, it was our first committee that we launched and it's been incredibly successful uh, in just a month or two, we have gotten this fantastic new uh, branding, as you see here by our wonderful advisory panelist, um, Amanda Weiss. Uh, we got our website up and running. Um, we have a Slack channel for that, very exciting. Um, and you would be working on you know, all of the social media, all of those emails that we send out. Um, and really being the sort of voice and face of our organization. Um, and since you're all members of, you know, uh, of our organization, we would love if you would be involved as well. So that is that. And we'll have a couple of other um, committees rolling out later in the year, um, but you know, slow and steady wins the race, so. Thank you, thank you so much, Sivan. Um, May I say something, Stefan? Uh, yeah, we're going to also have Q&A later, but if you brief, you want to say? Uh, I hope to get involved in trying to convince DeLauro and Murphy. Oh, wonderful. Absolutely. So, yeah, you're absolutely in the right place. Um, and then also for the committee, for example, outreach and fundraising, I think later we could share um, the next committee meeting dates and stuff like that for anybody who wants to get involved in those. So. Um, yeah, and then Zivan already mentioned it. Um, here, all the ways to follow us. Um, one can see a little bit of the impressions from the New Haven uh, Medicare for All resolution effort here, like uh, the tabling, the canvassing. Um, all right. So thank you so much for all of that. And um, yeah, now let's get right into our guest speaker presentations. And don't worry, like after each presentation, we're also like allotting a little bit of time for Q&A. So all of your questions that you have, like, um, please let us know, like, right after the presentation. And um, now it is my pleasure to introduce our first guest speaker. So um, Michael Leidy has organized, advocated, and developed policy for single payer Medicare for all nationally and in California for 30 years. He is a founding fellow of the Sanders Institute 
Uh, Michael was also director of public policy at uh, California Nurses Association, um, National Nurses United, where he worked for 25 years. Um, he is currently the president of Healthy California Now, a single payer coalition in the Golden State, representing a national union of healthcare workers. He is a leader in the national DSA Medicare for All campaign and serves on the board of People's Action. And also most recently, he was a healthcare constituency director for Bernie 2020. So I'm absolutely delighted. Um, Michael, please take it away. All right, just uh, thank you, Stefan. And I will uh, share my screen um, about, uh, currently that's disabled, but um, I, uh, I, I may not currently be co-host because I had to sign back on. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Connecticut, of course, has a proud history of working for uh, Medicare for All and Universal Healthcare. I remember when I was back east in the uh, 90s, we, we, we definitely saw a vibrant uh, coalition in Connecticut. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and uh, talk about what we're doing in California and some of the federal stuff. And as Stefan mentioned, I am president of Healthy California Now and this is a statewide single payer coalition that has been around for, for many years in different iterations. Uh, we had um, a coalition during the, um, really starting in the mid nineties during the 2000s. And then this current iteration really started in 2017 where we had um, a single payer bill uh, make it through the state Senate. And I'll talk a little bit about that. This is our most recent newsletter. Like, like you all, we have uh, different committees, ways for people to participate, including an organizing committee, a strategy committee, communications. We're governed by a board that has representation based on constituency. And we have uh, also affiliates and we meet monthly as both a board and as affiliates. And the um, current newsletter reflects our priorities, which is really to get Governor Newsom, uh, who ran on single payer, to keep that promise. We had action in June 15th, where we brought 300 folks to Sacramento to, pre to present uh, tens of thousands of petitions to the governor, urging him to pursue it. We have uh, been focused on, um, our affiliates have been focused on uh, beating back the recall, because we certainly don't want a governor who ran on single payer to be defeated. And that's happening today. And all the signs are that it looks promising about over 42% of the eligible voters have already turned in their ballots. And we just got a few hours left. Everyone's projecting a win uh, and a defeat of the recall, uh, a win for Governor Newsom. There's also a commission that the governor set up, we can talk a little bit more in depth about, which is considering pass to universal health care. They call it unified financing. We call it single payer. And there's also uh, very significantly uh, legislation, AB 1400, CalCare, which has been introduced by the California Nurses Association, National Nurses United. So uh, as always, we've got a full plate and that's an additional course to the federal work uh, where we're uh, part of the campaigns that you all are part of getting co-sponsors on HR 1976. And we'll talk a little bit about Medicare expansion uh, toward the end. So these are uh, a list of, of affiliates. You can see it's a nonpartisan coalition, consumer, labor, health, disability, LGBTQ, business and political organizations. Uh, we have sponsors, two of uh, the state's leading labor unions, the National Union of Healthcare Workers, which I represent, and also the machinist unions sponsor the coalition. And labor outreach is a key part of our current work talk a little bit about that. And we have the historic organizations that have been part of single payer, you'll recognize them nationally, like Physicians for National Health Program. Um, and then of course, the Healthcare for All Coalition in uh, California, who both statewide and its affiliates are a member. Probably like other places around the country, we've seen a real upsurge in activism among younger folks, primarily through the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, I've been a member for, for decades, but really the energy is coming from uh, folks in their 20s, and they have done a lot of work uh, on this campaign and for AB 1400. Uh, some of the most active groups uh, in the state 
are concentrated in Los Angeles, Healthcare for All LA, uh, DSA LA, but also the really um, base of the movement has often been in the Bay Area and it continues to be uh, very prominent in there. And you can see that we do have a number of unions uh, uh, who are affiliates, including labor councils in some counties. We've got um, unions from the entertainment industry, uh, from the hospitality industry. Unite Here is a very prominent, active member of the coalition. You've got the um, Sacramento Central Labor Council, the Alameda County Central Labor Council, San Francisco Building Trades, um, and so there is, an, and some SEIU locals, uh, including 10 to 1, which is one of the largest public sector unions in the state, uh, as well as uh, AFSCME workers at the University of California and um, other workers in the public and private sector. So we've got a, a good range of, of affiliates, including, of course, California Nurses Association, which really had funded and driven the coalition in its uh, 2017, 2018 period. So just briefly, a history of single payer legislation. Um, the bills SB 921 and SB 840 were really uh, quite prominent in the, in the 2000s in the aughts. And in fact, they made it to the governor's desk. But guess what? The Republican governor, you may have heard of him, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, vetoed it. And when we talk about the 2000 uh, recall, where Governor Schwarzenegger was elected in a similar procedure as going on today. Uh, one of the consequences was we had a governor that was not open to single payer and he vetoed it twice. And as you can see, it enjoyed quite significant support from Democrats in the legislature. A little cynical about that perhaps. Uh, our view has been that as long as there's a Republican governor to veto it, Democrats are on board things get a little iffy when that changes. And that's what happened in 2017 and 2018, when uh, the legislature enjoyed a significant Democratic majority. And there was, of course, a Democratic governor in Jerry Brown. We were able to pass it out of the Senate. This was the top priority for the California Nurses Association, but it was held in the assembly, ostensibly because it didn't include specific financing provisions. But as you can see from the prior bills, they didn't either and yet they made it all the way to the governor. But the truth is Governor Brown didn't support it and therefore it got bottled up before it could reach his desk. In response, they set up a select committee on universal coverage and healthcare delivery systems. It gave a report that was supposed to be the alternative to SB 562. Guess what? Nothing happened. We found ourselves now in the period of, of 2021, uh, where the California Nurses Association have reintroduced a bill, AB 1400, very significant piece of legislation, really building upon HR 1976, the Jaya Paul Medicare for All bill. It was not in the California legislature, it's a two year process. There are deadlines for the first year. It did not get referred to a policy committee in time to move forward in the first year of the legislative session. So it now became a two year bill and must pass the assembly by the end of January, 2022. So it will become uh, live again in January and a uh, health committee hearing is expected. The, um, there's an ambitious campaign that CNA and NU is uh, recruiting volunteers for to build up a kind of what we know from past Bernie campaigns and other digital organizing campaigns as a distributed organizing campaign through text banks, phone banks, and also in person, hopefully, uh, legislative meetings to put pressure on 30 members of the assembly uh, in key districts to get on the bill. Right now it has, I think, 11 co-sponsors in the assembly. It represents a significant move forward for guaranteed health care, guarantees health care for all residents as a human right, establishes a single standard of quality care as a right, and has provisions, broader provisions for guaranteeing equity and culturally competent care. It does have differences with past single payer bills in that it precludes inter integrated delivery systems, which not only include Kaiser Permanente, which has about 8 million Californians that it covers, but also other uh, integrated delivery systems uh, that exist in the state through community clinic consortiums and so forth. That's been an issue, a policy issue. Um, 
where it also um, precludes membership-based systems like Kaiser and per capita payments. So some of these issues have been discussed at the Healthy California for All Commission. Uh, Healthy California now has focused on the commission, which was established by the governor and by the legislature. It's going to report in a similar time frame that AB 1400 is going to be considered in January, possibly February of this of 2022. And so what we're seeing to the Healthy California for All Commission, which includes appointees, includes a representative from the CNA and other advocates for single payer, as well as organizations that are more skeptical and some policy folks who are frankly opposed. But there have been presentations from uh, Dr. Shao, who, who uh, you may know from Vermont, who has designed healthcare systems around the world, was, was active in the Vermont um, struggle in uh, 2011 and 2014. He put forward an analysis along with other consultants that showed that if we don't do anything in California, we're going to spend $800 billion a year on healthcare by 2031. So it's quite, quite uh, unsustainable, the present system. And so the commission is taking a very serious look. And most recently, its chair said that he hopes the report includes and expects the report to include a path on how to get to single payer. But there still is many obstacles to consider, including resolving this debate about uh, payment methodologies, integrated healthcare delivery systems. There's going to be a series of meetings coming up in September and October that will, I think, really mark how uh, the direction of that commission. We focused on the governor because, as you can see from the past, Governor Schwarzenegger, Governor Brown's failure to support single payer in the last uh, 17 or so years has been fatal to it. And Governor Newsom ran on single payer, says he remains committed to it, has reached out to the Biden administration to seek their support. So we're urging him to pursue what we know as the federal waiver. And that waiver enables states to integrate federal monies into a single payer system. And in fact, it's not possible to design a state financing plan until you know when uh, and how much the feds are going to contribute. We've... Um, We've adopted the strategy because it focuses on a single decision maker with power, the, a strategy that has credibility with opinion leaders, and he's the one ultimately that will carry the recommendations from that Healthy California for All Commission uh, forward. Uh, here's a, a former member of the assembly who talks about this strategy. This is a Los Angeles uh, school board member, Jackie Bol Goldberg, who has a long history going back to the um, uh, radical 60s in Los Angeles. Uh, and she makes it very clear. Uh, we, we need the governor to seek a waiver. It's very strategic. It's the administrations in Sacramento change and go back and forth. The bill comes and goes, authors come and go. But once you have a waiver, once you know what the federal government is going to do, then you can uh, build a, a system around it and have a real uh, benchmark and momentum going forward. And the fact is, without governor leadership, it simply won't happen. And she makes a very strong case for that. Some have uh, insisted that we have to pass a bill first, and there are federal guidelines and regulations that do allow a governor to, uh, either through executive order or using existing legislation to seek that waiver. Regardless, every you can enter into informal negotiations with the federal government, lay out a plan and use that the basis for financing and state legislation. So our objective is really ultimately for Gavin Newsom to lead the way. And he has supported it. Here he is in 2018, the executive needs to lead it. Obamacare wouldn't have happened if it was just exclusively a legislative fiat. We saw that in Massachusetts, unfortunately, with, with Governor Romney. And um, you have to have, uh, you know, uh, a change from what the past has been. And he recognized that when he campaigned for office, he has not fulfilled that promise and we're demanding that he do so. Uh, governor Shumlin, who you may remember was governor of Vermont during the time they sought to do single payer, has said the same thing. Uh, the legislature can't lead. They have to uh, have a salesperson and, and he is, thinks that Gavin Newsom can be that salesperson. First, he's got to survive the recall, so we'll see. But he has uh, managed to 
to navigate through some pretty treacherous waters, obviously, during the pandemic. Um, and finally, the Speaker of the Assembly, and Anthony Rendon, uh, shows strong support for a Healthy California Now's effort to pass and enact single-payer health care and seeking federal approval as the foundation for a state-sponsored plan as a crucial step. So you can see how there is an alliance. The AB 1400 effort moves the legislature, puts pressure on the governor to act. Getting the governor to lead sets up the legislature to have no excuses to act. And so we see these strategies as complementary and very effective in combination. And you can see from some key uh, decision makers that we're in a unique position in California, that this is, in a, this is not um, uh, as far away as it is at the federal level. You've got a president at the federal level who has said he's opposed to Medicare for all. Unfortunately, that makes a huge difference. And you can see that as it plays out in the Medicare expansion fight. I don't think any of us need to imagine the difference between what a president Sanders or President Warren would be doing right now uh, on health care versus what um, is going on in, in, the, in Congress and what President Biden. President Biden ran on expanding Medicare age to 60. He's not expending a dime of political capital to make it happen. Senator Sanders is and others are trying to expand Medicare to include dental benefits. But there's a fight. And there's, they're basically uh, being told, hey, you got $700 million dollars uh, for healthcare, uh, seven hundred billion dollars for healthcare. Uh, figure out how you're going to spend it, and if it means that we're going to spend it on subsidies to commercial insurance through the ACA or or expanding Medicaid through the ACA. Well, then those are the priorities of Speaker Pelosi and the House leadership. So Medicare expansion gets what's left over, despite the fact that the bulk of that money comes from savings from prescription drug price negotiations under Medicare. So essentially, they're robbing Peter to pay Paul. They're taking money that is savings from Medicare and spending it to subsidize the profits of private insurance companies. It's unacceptable. That's a fight worth having. And the initial proposal in the House for dental benefits with 90% out-of-pocket co-pays, effective 2028, is quite frankly ludicrous. And so there's a real fight to get a meaningful expansion of dental benefits. And even though the president, as I said, ran on lowering the age to 60, uh, that doesn't seem to be currently part of the House strategy. We are, uh, like you all are, fighting for the state-based universal health care. Uh, we believe maybe there's an opportunity to get some of those provisions in, a, in through Congress without the full-blown bill, possibly through reconciliation. We're also pushing, uh, we've had tremendous support uh, from the Democratic Party in California for H.R. 1976. Like you all, there have been resolutions passed at the local level for Medicare for All, both for the federal bill and for the state bill and for the governor leadership. So our resolution campaign often combines all three of them. And then we're, of course, working for the state-based Universal Health Care Act itself. So we've got a real fight on our hands, but we've got some unique opportunities. We've got the opportunity to show that Medicare really can be an expansive and improved public program. We've got real political leadership in California, a unique opportunity here that we haven't had in the past to actually show us a model for the country to really as, as Savan said, to take that template of the state-based universal health care and use that as a model. Governor Shumlin said that if California were really serious and, and on uh, directly about to implement single payer, the Democrats in Congress would be pretty hard pressed not to follow and would probably feel compelled to do so. So we always see this as a political strategy. We've talked, you know, for years about what the moral righteous thing to do is. We've talked about what the policy case is unassailable, overwhelmingly in favor of single payer. And we keep saying to the Democrats, well, you just got to do the right thing. And they haven't. They're beholden to the insurance industry, to the pharmaceutical companies. We've got to show that it is in their political interest to do Medicare for all, regardless of whether they want to or not. And when the biggest, most democratic union in the state does it, that shows it can be done and it should be done. And it creates a totally different political dynamic. That's it's it's time to not just ex exhort and and demand, but actually prove that it's politically possible and do it. And it's in the political interest of Democrats. And if they don't do it, then it's the time to move them out of office. 
and make this truly a litmus test for how to guarantee healthcare as a human right. So thank you for, for this opportunity to present. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Michael, that's amazing. Thank you for this presentation. Um, when it comes to Q&A, um, we go here by the stack system. So um, in case you would like to ask a question, please type the word stack, that's S-T-A-C-K into the chat. Or like if you're on the phone, please just say, uh, say stack. Um, and then we can uh, try to go through all of the questions here. I already um, saw a question in the chat. I think there were already some answers, but I do want to bring it to our guest speaker. Um, so the question was, um, why would healthcare as a single payer system be less? So I think that means less expensive. Yeah, less expensive. Well, exactly. Number one, you take out the administrative waste of fragmentation. There's a huge amount of money spent on just administering healthcare, uh, as much as 12%. You can eliminate most of that and radically reduce the amount that's spent on administration. Think how much um, uh, labor and, and cost goes into denying care, to determining eligibility, to managing benefits. When you can just, when you have a set of guaranteed benefits and you have the ability to go to any provider of your choice, you simply don't need all those gatekeepers and all that administrative process. Moreover, if you've got a single payer, you don't have to bill hundreds of insurance companies. There are whole floors of hospitals devoted to billing. There, there are clerks in hospitals that have to be expert on literally hundreds of health plans. All that goes away. It's a huge savings. Secondly, if you, it's estimated that you can reduce pharmaceutical costs by 40 to 50%. Now, if they do that through Medicare price negotiations, that's halfway there. But those savings, if they get funneled into the Affordable Care Act, are going to have to be then shifted back into a public system. But the savings are still there. Whether you, you spend them now in the short term on the ACA and Medicare expansion, you can still achieve them and apply them to state single payer once the state uh, adopts a universal system. So pharmaceutical uh, savings and uh, savings from uh, administrative waste are the major ways you save money. Secondly, you actually save money when you cover everyone and devote more resources to prevention, to public health. Imagine if we had a real robust public health system, we wouldn't have had 620,000 plus deaths under COVID. And the pandemic has really exposed both the failure of employer-based insurance and also the failure of the public health system. And it's estimated that 40% of the deaths under COVID in the US would have prevented if we had had a national healthcare system like Medicare for all, 40%. We have the most deaths um, you know, per capita of any country uh, of, our, of our type in the world. Um, and so it's really quite extraordinary, the impact of saving lives and saving money that the single payer would have. And in a state like California, which is the sixth or fifth biggest largest economy in the world, it's like a nation doing it. Great, great. Um, I think that was um, a really good answer. Um, Carrie, I know you think you answered, asked the question. Does this yes. answer? Yes, it, I was I was kind of specific to California, but definitely it's it's um, like I said, I worked in health insurance in the 90s and it's it's only gotten worse. And it's very uh, they spend more time denying you than they do actually providing care. So and, and also, um, you know, I know a lot of these services are farmed out too to these other little companies. And, and unfortunately, that's all lobby for them to keep their jobs. But. Like I, I recently, I'm very, I'm healthy, but I recently had surgery and there was a separate company, which I looked him up, this guy who was a doctor out in, Cal I was actually I think in California or somewhere out West who decided that I didn't really need to be an inpatient in the hospital overnight. I was going to be an outpatient. So they obviously paid him to make that decision, which was just, I don't know, that's foolish. Well, you, you know, Carrie, that, that, that insurance is, a risk model, right? And yep. Stephen will end up talking about this more, but basically they're going to eliminate risk. 
Yeah, and we used to talk about about dog groups. That was a dog group. We got to get yeah. rid of that group. We don't want to insure them. Yeah, that's you know, a dog yeah. group. <laughs> a lot exactly. of cancer. A lot of cancer in that group. Dog group. <laughs> that's the difference between a universal healthcare system that provides care and an insurance-based system that denies it because it's in their financial interest to deny it, but it's in the universal healthcare system to provide it uh, in their interest of a universal healthcare system to provide it at the earliest point possible. So there's an incentive to provide care as opposed to an incentive to deny it. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for the question and also for the answer. And I saw like a lot more questions coming in here in the chat. Um, so uh, yeah, let's say like at least um, eight o'clock in the latest, we should move on of course also for, to the second um, guest speaker presentation, but maybe we can just go at least through the questions here that had already been asked. So um, uh, yeah, I see one question here, for example, some people in Connecticut think um, single payer will only work federally, not at the state level. So do you think state level single payer is worthy to pursue? I'm going to let Dr. Kemble take that answer because I know that's the bulk of his presentation or a big part of his presentation. But I will say one thing, and that is I, Governor Shumlin had a good insight. If a state like California does this, it is so compelling. We excuse me, have to understand the political impact. Ultimately, this is a political strategy. It may be difficult to do perfect single payer at the state level depends on how much we can integrate the federal programs and capture that federal money. But we know we can create the political basis and show the political interest among Democrats to do it. And we know it can work much, much better than the employer-based commercial profit-making system. You take profits out, you take administrative waste out, you guarantee healthcare to everybody, you just dramatically improve people's quality of life, establish peace of mind, a single standard of quality care that is guaranteed, <clears throat> all of a sudden the whole landscape changes. All of a sudden people have a different sense of what's possible and what we deserve. Oftentimes we just don't think we deserve it. And it's quite unique among industrialized countries, our, our attitude toward healthcare, it's, it's absurd. Of course we deserve it. And it's only the profit making system that denies it to us. So that's what we change when, it's, when California uh, does this. It creates a whole different political dynamic. Great, great. Um, thank you so much. Um, I know um, that's also going to be covered in the second guest speaker presentation, but thank you for that answer. And then um, I see another question here. Um, how do you counter the argument that too many jobs will be lost if single payer were to exist? Well, it's, it's number one. <clears throat> It is also true that there'll be new jobs created because we estimate demand might for healthcare might go up 15%, uh, perhaps less in a state uh, like California where there are a lot of folks who are already covered in some way, but there's a huge amount of under insurance. You know, 25% of people have, have deferred care or not gotten care because they couldn't afford it. And those are among the insured. So we know there's going to be more clinical jobs. We also know that we have to have a program for economic security for workers who are displaced. We can never dismiss that, but we can never use that as a barrier to do the program. Nationally, that might be as many as 1.8 million jobs between the billing among providers and the administrative jobs in insurance. We've got to have a program. And, and the bill, for example, AB 1400, has a very robust program to provide uh, economic security to bridge to retirement for those older workers, to provide new placements for people who want to go into jobs that will be available to provide training and education to people who wanna have different careers. What we've learned during the pandemic is that people aren't gonna stay in dead end jobs. And let's face it, these administrative jobs are dead end jobs now, and they don't add any value to care, to healthcare. And so we have an opportunity, just like in the fossil fuel industry, we're not going to avoid the transition away from fossil fuels because workers are displaced, but we're also not gonna leave those workers behind. And the same thing is for healthcare. We've got an urgent social need to guarantee healthcare, just as we have an urgent need to address the climate crisis, just as we have an urgent need to continue to address the unemployment crisis caused by the pandemic. So what we're talking about is a much more robust 
safety net, a much more robust program for economic security for workers, which because we save so much money, if you devote, devote one to 2% of the program revenue over a period of five years, you can easily transition and cover those workers. That's what uh, UMass Amherst study said back in 2017. That's what the Jayapal bill, HR 1976 anticipates as well, is that with that relatively modest amount of funding, we can protect these workers. Great, great, wonderful. Um, yeah, and so I think you kind of answered basically two questions in one here because another question in chat was specifically if we eliminate a lot of administrative overhead, that means a lot of these administrators will lose their jobs. Are there any plans to retrain these people to do other things? So I think you addressed that um, already in the answer. Um, yeah, and then um, just kind of because in Connecticut we did introduce um, now for the first time in many years like these single payer bills this year and of course we don't have quite as many co-sponsors yet I mean we're thrilled about all the support and all the co-sponsors but um, I know for example the state of New York has for example a majority in both um, the state house uh, I mean I think it's called assembly and the state senate so um, would you be able to kind of give us a sense of how much support in the legislature does single payer have in California and so how much um, is it really on the cusp, so to speak, of actually being implemented? Well, we're not there yet, frankly, in the legislature. Um, and I think that's why it takes governor leadership. But CNA has got a very robust program developing to put pressure on at least 30 you know, key members of the assembly, including the chair of the assembly health committee who sits on that Healthy California for All commission. One of the things that... that um, you know, you asked is how do you build this kind of coalition? I think it, it has to be a community labor coalition, but you have to recognize that in a state like California, it's these institutions and organize, organizations that drive policy making in Sacramento, in the state capital. So you have to get these key institutional players. We're taking on pharmaceutical and insurance companies, right? We're taking on the chamber. So we're going to have to have some level of business support. We're going to have to have a deep commitment from the labor uh, movement, from the trade unions. And we're going to have to have a robust community-based program. So those community-based organizations, we're going to have to have the philanthropic foundations that have literally billions to spend, as I know they do in, in Connecticut as well, those, those foundations exist. They need to get on board and actually carry out their mission. Their mission is universal health care. You can't do it under a commercial private insurance system. So they have to be convinced to switch to universal health care through single payer and educate people accordingly, because ultimately this is going to be on the ballot. And we've got, so it's a matter of, it, it, that's what the Healthy California for All Commission does, is bring in the key institutional players, give us the opportunity to persuade them, get them on board. But the only person who can consolidate that is the governor. Secondly, when you reach out to labor unions, we have to do it in a way that specifically addresses their particular concerns. Public sector unions are going to have different concerns. You saw that in New York. Why didn't the bill get a vote in New York? It's because the public sector union said, whoa, wait a minute, we, we're not on board. We've got to address their concerns about the monies that they've foregone or put into healthcare, how are they going to recoup those? How are those going to be accounted for? How are the public sector jobs going to be dealt with? How are healthcare workers going to be affected so that these savings don't get taken out of the wages and benefits of, of healthcare workers? How are the um, trust funds, what role are they going to be for building trades and other trust funds to provide supplemental benefits like they do in Canada? So what we have to do is we have to get the committed core together first and then use those folks to reach out to their uh, colleagues and their comrades in, the, in other unions and, and in their sectors in order to build that level of support. We've got to get the community-based organizations that are funded by the foundations to say, we want you to engage in this effort because our communities have are done with the incremental approach. I mean, you know, they spent, for example, in, in California, a billion dollars on what they called healthy communities, 100 million a year for 10 years. Guess which communities were devastated by COVID? Many of those that had been funded to be healthy. It wasn't enough. And that's why we're at a point where that kind of incrementalism has played out. And so we do have to have a specific approach to these or organizations, unions, constituencies 
that says, yeah, we're going to guarantee you, we're going to fund your community clinic. We're going to guarantee your constituency healthcare in a way that they've never been able to get it before because they're going to be facilities in your neighborhoods. And we're going to, we're going to take care of those workers and we're going to save your trust fund literally hundreds of millions of dollars. We're going to save school districts in California a billion dollars. That can go to teacher uh, hiring more teachers, improved wages, improved classrooms, improved resources. The biggest advocates for healthcare reform should be parents and teachers because the money the state spends, which includes $80 billion in unfunded liabilities for retiree health in California, will instead go to education by law. So that's how we have to, that's why the California Federation of Teachers is a big supporter of Healthy California now. And so then they've got to reach out to their other healthcare uh, sector unions. California School Employees Association, longtime supporter of single payer. Unite Here, which has been devastated by the employer-based system in the, as the hospitality industry tanked during the pandemic. Big supporters of single payer in California. That's how you, you build the coalition is by showing how it addresses the particular needs and, and issues of each sector uh, affected. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, thank you. And um, yeah, earlier we actually did also have a um, Connecticut state representative here on the call, um, State Representative David Michel, who actually was also one of the co-sponsors of the single payer bill in I'll step Connecticut. On. Yes, uh, we do have Susan Johnson raising her hand. Yes, and so um, I was just going to say, uh, so oh, I see I'm the raised sorry. hand here by Susan Johnson. Um, so is that Connecticut state representative Susan Johnson? Yes, it, yes, it is. Oh, it's wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure, really. Uh, thank you for all the work you've been doing on Medicare for All. It's been something I've been following because of my background in Medicare. And also, I did co-sponsor the legislation as well. Um, I, I just uh, appreciate everything that you're doing. A, a couple of thoughts, though, about what I've been discovering as I talk to people about uh, trying to do Medicare for All or somehow connecting the Affordable Care Act with the Medicare program like we have some of it sketched together a little bit through the Medicare Savings Program that does pay for the uh, supplemental part of the Medicare program uh, for people within a certain income range. And uh, at some point, I'd love to see this all come together. But one of the problems I see with uh, some of the uh, situations in Connecticut has to do with the fact that we have the unregulated uh, market, the unregulated insurance uh, policies, and the unregulated insurance policies particularly for young people in, say, education, are, are they think that they're having a good deal uh, because the cost is so low. But then when they get to the $6,000 deductible and something comes along, they realize that it's not such a good deal. Uh, so uh, one of the problems I think that we have to communicate is the two, two types of policies for health insurance. One is through the employee benefit plan that is totally regulated, um, and the other is the unregulated plans which have ERISA problems because uh, it's all tangled up in Supreme Court, um, you know, laws and uh, case law rather. So I just I thought I'd throw that out there in terms of how how we can maybe formulate a plan to uh, proceed. The other thing about this is uh, almost entirely in, in um, uh, with respect to Medicare, uh, it is administered through uh, contracts uh, that go out to bid with the federal government by insurance companies, private insurance companies. The difference is, is that they're controlled uh, and they have to compete to, uh, to get those contracts with the feds. So uh, that's, that's the other thing. Now, on the other hand, when you look at the Medicaid program, a lot of the states have also asked for Medicaid managed care, but aha, what they're doing is they're paying much, much more than they need to pay for uh, anything, anybody to manage uh, their Medicaid programs. And I'll give you a quick example. Delaware uh, has a population of uh, somewhere uh, under 900,000 people. And they're spending, uh, back a few years ago, they're spending about $8 billion on their Medicaid program. Connecticut uh, got rid of the Medicaid managed care. And we have uh, gone out to bid for our own, uh, our own uh, control over our, uh, the administration of the program. And uh, we have three and a half million people in Connecticut and we are spending, we were back then spending six billion a year. So we're saving $2 billion a year just by keeping the private insurance companies out of that program. The other thing about that, when we did have it back for, from 96 to about 2010, 
is that they wouldn't share the data because it's a, a, a trade secret. So uh, <laughs> they, they have to be watched every single second. And uh, so I just thought I'd throw some of those things out there in terms of how how we look at the program, how we uh, look at uh, the, uh, the ridiculous uh, deductibles that these places are paying, public public uh, schools are paying, these teachers are paying these really ridiculous uh, amounts in terms of the deductibles. But um, anyway, I just can't uh, be pleased enough and I can't wait to have everything come together where, where we're finally getting a healthcare system that, that works and um, I think that's really very important. So thank you for everything you're doing. I just want to say thank you, um, Ms. Johnson. I, I, I think um, particularly congratulate Connecticut on getting the private insurers out of um, Medicaid because in California, the, the, the excess profits, have been, they identified this one actuarial study identified like over 5 billion in excess profits. In, I, I, and that's not even just excess costs, that's excess profits, right? It's just extraordinary. And so I really applaud Connecticut for doing that. And I can tell you those deductibles are outrageous. I was trying to buy a plan on the exchange, $1,000 a month in premium, okay. Seven thousand seventy five hundred dollars in de in uh, deductible plus uh, copay, so your out of pocket max is pretty high, and yeah, you can pay twenty one hundred dollars a month instead, but then your then your out of pocket max is maybe what fourteen hundred or, or fifteen hundred, but who's got the extra eleven hundred a month? So of course people choose the lower premium. And, and suffer on, on the other side of the out-of-pocket cost. So thank you so much for what you're doing. Yes, thank you, thank you so and much. I appreciate that. I, you know, it's just, it's just phenomenal uh, what we could save and provide. But the other thing is, is that it doesn't necessarily mean that the people who are in those private insurance companies uh, would actually be without employment because they're still gonna have claims to process. So, I mean, it's just a matter of making those, uh, looking at the anal analyzing how it works now and seeing what kinds of bridges we can make uh, so that they will still be employed and will still be processing claims. The numbers of claims are not going to go down. Uh, so, so we still have to be able to do all that work. So thank you again. Yes, um, thank you so much, Representative Susan Johnson. And um, yes, this is a wonderful, lively discussion. We're a little bit behind schedule. So um, at this point of time, I just would like to say, um, thank you so much, uh, Michael. Um, yeah, one of the best policy and organizing minds who has dedicated um, so much years, so many years to, to Medicare for all. So thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we just wanted to continue with one of the um, leading policy um, experts here on uh, single payer. So um, jumping right in. Thank you, Stefan. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> Um, yes, and um, so uh, for the introduction, I just want to say a little bit about um, our guest speaker, um, Dr. Stephen Campbell. So uh, Dr. Campbell attended medical school at University of Hawaii and Harvard, and he trained in both internal medicine and psychiatry. He uh, recently retired from the private practice um, of psychiatry, but he still practices part-time um, in Queen Emma Clinic, a hospital-based primary care clinic. Um, including caring for mostly Medicaid patients and teaching psychiatric issues in general medical care to internal medicine residents. He is an assistant clinical professor of both medicine and psychiatry at the Yapscom. He is also a past president of both the Hawaii Psychiatric Medical Association and the Hawaii Medical Association. Dr. Campbell has a longstanding interest in health policy and healthcare reform, and he was appointed to the Hawaii Health Authority in 2011, charged with overall health planning for the state of Hawaii and designing a universal healthcare system covering everyone in the state. He has been a member of Physicians for a National Health Program, um, which now there also is a Connecticut chapter of. Um, so uh, yeah, Dr. Campbell has been a member of Physicians for a National Health Program, which of course is a physician single payer advocacy organization since 1989. And Dr. Campbell also currently serves on the PNHP board. So having said all that, I'm just so delighted um, that he made the time to join us tonight. So uh, Dr. Campbell, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, 
So is state level single payer a viable endeavor is the title of my talk. And I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, okay, so what's wrong with our current health insurance business model and how could single payer solve these problems? Competitive insurance means you have a fragmented risk pool and uh, it's this risk pool is split up among different competing organizations, each of which has an incentive to avoid financial risk, which means avoiding either covering or paying for sicker, more socially disadvantaged and more complex patients. And this is supposed to be corrected with risk adjustment, but that's very complex. The best formulas only capture about 12% of the variability in cost. So the risk adjustment formulas are utterly ineffective in preventing cherry picking uh, healthier patients by um, risk bearing entities. And also insurance companies or uh, provider groups that have insurance risk game diagnosis codes to beat risk adjustment formulas by upcoding people to make them look as sick as possible so they can capture a higher payment. The result is disparities in access to care and high administrative costs. And the administrative costs include the cost of competition, the cost of risk, and this is, you know, there's ups and downs every year in the cost of healthcare and, you know, and the claims that come in. And if the insurance company is bearing the risk, then they say, okay, you pay us and we'll cover that risk. We'll cover the ups and downs, but they make sure they charge enough in premium so they're very unlikely to lose money. And so anyone who's shifting insurance risk onto insurance companies or competing um, healthcare delivery systems that are, that are bearing risk has to pay a premium for that convenience of pushing the risk onto someone else. There's the cost of a very complex payment system this runs somewhere around 15% of gross revenues for physicians, around 15% of gross revenues for hospitals, and comparable amounts of money for the insurance companies or the government programs that are funding them. So it's a huge amount of administrative waste, as Michael Eddy said. And there's also high administrative costs to the latest policy fad, which is value-based payment, which means shifting insurance risk onto doctors and hospitals. And that carries high administrative costs. In fact, we do not have a problem of overutilization. We have a problem of excessive administrative costs, much higher than in other countries. This is a famous PNHP graph, and I just want to point out the red is managers and administrators, the green at the bottom is physicians, and the growth since 1970s. And the steep jump in the 90s is the managed care era, when we brought in all these third party guys who are supposed to make healthcare more cost effective. What they did is they add, added huge amounts of administration. And at the end, we have another bump, which is the value-based payment bump promoted by the Affordable Care Act, which has a new uh, version of HMOs, which is ACOs, Accountable Care Organizations, Integrated Delivery Systems, who are supposed to accept insurance risk. And that's resulted in another bump in administrators. And uh, this is just comparing the US total administrative overhead of our system with Canada, a single payer system. And as you can see, it's about four times more administration here than there is there. And Canada doesn't even have single payer for drugs. They could save even more if they included drugs in their single payer program. So single payer enables a single risk pool, a non-fragmented risk pool, universal access to the same care delivery system for everyone, and it allows us to pay hospitals with global operating budgets instead of using fee for service. And this eliminates gaming of diagnosis and it eliminates the incentive for unnecessary care. And it saves 15% off the top. And it allows us to pay doctors with a simplified standardized payment system that does not cost 15% of revenues and similar costs on the payer side. We could design a physician payment system that's either salaries for physicians employed by hospitals or community health centers or things like that, or a more incentive neutral version of fee for service that would be much less expensive to administer. And we can enable collective negotiation of fees, which they do in Canada, and which provides good balance between the interests of physicians and the interests of taxpayers and society, and keeping healthcare affordable. So how can state level reforms advance single payer goals? We can start with the components of the healthcare system that are under state control, which is state and county employee and retiree health benefits and Medicaid. And these are typically around 30 to 40% of a state's budget and they cover around 30% to 40% of a state's population. 
if a state were to kick insurance companies out, as Connecticut did with Medicaid, and I'll get into that a bit more later, if states were to self-insure these two programs and eliminate competing risk-bearing insurance plans, they could get control of the payment system, simplify, standardize it, so you would have the same payment system, the same fees uh, across Medicare and employer benefits, I mean, Medicaid and employer, employee benefits. Uh, and that would result in substantial administrative costs to the state. And you can use non-risk administrative services only contracts for necessary administration, for claims processing, for credentialing, for things that you need to do administratively in a single payer system. But the key is they're non-risk bearing. So you're not saying, here's the money, you take the risk. We're saying, we'll take the risk for paying the claims, but we want you to do these specific jobs and we're contracting with you to those, do those jobs. Dealing with ERISA. Actually, I missed a slide back at the beginning. Hold on a sec. Okay, yeah, I missed this slide. We agree a national single payer system would be ideal, but there are two major obstacles. One is capturing the money for federally funded programs like Medicare, the VA, Indian Health. And the second is the ERISA law, which exempts self-funded employer and union-based health plans from state insurance laws and regulations. So that, uh, this is on what to do about ERISA. So I think the best solution to ERISA, Hawaii has an ERISA waiver, but I think we're in a unique situation because we had just passed a law called the Prepaid Healthcare Act, which has an employer mandate, and that would be a violation of ERISA. And they passed the ERISA law a couple of months later, and our Senator Inouye persuaded um, Congress to give us an exemption to ERISA so we can implement the Stephen, law. That we sorry, yeah. um, I think the slides uh, screen sharing it, uh, was lost. Okay, let me see if I can find that. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yes. So uh, if we bypass ERISA and say, we're going to establish a universal tax fund funded healthcare system that covers everyone in the state, let self-funded employers and unions continue their plans if they want to. So we're not messing with ERISA. You can continue to have your own plan, but since they all have to pay taxes, they'd be paying for healthcare twice. Very few unions or corporations would put up with that. They would very quickly, as long as the public plan was good, they would quickly drop their ERISA plan and, and uh, take advantage of the public system. So I think this is the way around ERISA. You, you just go around it. You don't try to fight with it. Okay, why states should avoid shifting insurance risk onto doctors and hospitals. So insurance is a system for managing financial risk and it's designed for risks that are infrequent, expensive and unpredictable like lightning striking your house and having it burned down, stuff like that. That's what insurance is ideally designed for. And the main way of managing risks that meet all these three criteria is risk pooling. You, everyone contributes a little every month and the unlucky person who has their house burned down then has the money to cover it. And we all share in the risk and spread it across a large population. That's risk pooling. That's the valuable part of insurance. The extent that risk is predictable then insurance, the insurance business model uses underwriting, which is trying to analyze where risk is predictable so that they can either refuse to cover it or charge more for it. And this undermines the whole purpose of health insurance. And the problem with healthcare is way too much of the risk is predictable. We have pre-existing conditions, demographics, social determinants of health, way too much is predictable. So when you apply the insurance business model in healthcare, you get a very strong incentive to avoid risk. So who has risk? It's whoever has the money and is stuck with covering the ups and downs of healthcare costs. And it means that there's an opportunity for profit or retained earnings and a risk of loss. And the clearest example is capitation where you're paid per member a fixed amount of money to cover healthcare. And if the healthcare, if you spend more on healthcare than that money you lose, and if you don't spend that much on healthcare, you get to keep the difference. That's what 
Capitation means that's what a risk-bearing entity is. And it also includes any payment scheme that holds providers of care accountable for the cost or outcomes of care, which depend largely on patient characteristics that are beyond their control. So an insurance risk-bearing entity has specific, specific enrollees or assignees or members and is paid by the enrollee or assignee or member and has a contract obligating them to call all, cover all medical care for that, those members. This includes HMOs, ACOs, integrated delivery systems, and capitated doctors. Okay, the rationale for risk shifting in healthcare is that the theory is excessive US healthcare costs is be, because fee for service provides an incentive to maximize volume of care. And uh, so we supposedly have a lot of overutilization due to fee for service. So if we flip the incentives and pay doctors or systems upfront to cover the cost of care, then their incentive is to only deliver care that's truly necessary and not deliver unnecessary care. This requires big data to analyze risk. Ultimately, it's for the purpose of avoiding risk or charging more for it, but you need a whole lot of detailed information in order to manage risk. The problem is the premise is false. Utilization of care in the US is toward the low end of industrialized countries that cover everyone for half what we do, usually using fee-for-service. There's no evidence of excessive utilization in primary care paid with fee-for-service. I've never seen any studies showing that anywhere in the country. There are perverse incentives when you shift insurance risk. You have an incentive not to deliver unnecessary, unnecessary care, but you also have an incentive to skimp on necessary care and to avoid sicker, more complex and socially disadvantaged patients that might cost more. And the counter incentives are pay for outcomes, which exacerbates the incentive to cherry pick and risk adjustment, which is way too complex to do accurately. And if you try to make it more accurate, you result, it results in a prohibitive administrative costs and burdens. This is a study showing that doctors who are, who are being subjected to insurance risk quickly abandon private practice and go to work for bigger organizations like hospitals that can afford to take on that risk. The hospitals have the clout to force higher fees, and they do. Primary care physicians employed by hospitals charge Medicare 78% more than independent primary care doctors, specialists 74% more, and surgeons 224% more. And uh, this is an accelerating trend of doctors moving to employment by hospital systems, and it's resulting in higher costs for everyone. Okay, uh, what is happening to healthcare reform in Hawaii? Okay, in 1974, we passed the Prepaid Healthcare Act, which has an employer mandate, and we got an ERISA exemption for that. This means we've had broad coverage of the population since 74, mandated comprehensive benefits, no pre existing condition exclusions, and no deductibles. And co pays are limited to 10 to 20% of charges, which is like the ACA gold and platinum level. And we had mostly small independent practices paid with fee for service. And this is in place from 74 until the Affordable Care Act. As of 2008, we had the best benefits, the broadest coverage, and the best access to care in the whole country. Our dominant insurer standardized and controlled fees, uh, so that was similar to what single payer could do, and kept the payment system relatively simple. They prided themselves on having among the lowest administrative costs of any insurer in the country. There are minimal controls on utilization we had among the lowest administrative costs in the US and among the lowest commercial health insurance in the pre premiums in the US. So we had by far the most cost-effective system in the country. And our per capita Medicare costs were also the lowest in the US. So with the Affordable Care Act, we are told you're doing everything wrong, you're using fee for service, you need to do something different. They should have listened to what we were doing and had the rest of the country follow us. So HMSA is our dominant insurer, and they jumped on board the value-based payment bandwagon. They have not engaged in risk avoidance because they have too big a market share to do so, but all their competitors do. They market to healthy people. They uh, have unfriendly policies to complex patients. Uh, they, they tend to set up shops in wealthier neighborhoods. They have ways of gaming the risk pool so they get a healthier than average risk pool. 
HMSA is stuck with the rest. So they latched on to the idea of value-based payment because it would enable them to push the risk onto the doctors instead of them being in that role. And then doctors have the incentive to avoid sick people and to skimp on care. And also doing this requires a large amount of data. And so HMSA says, oh, we can do that. We're an insurance company. We can get detailed data for risk adjustment, detailed data for quality measures, this kind of stuff. So this means high administrative costs and it's driving doctors out of practice into appointment by hospitals who can raise prices. And they don't care because they can raise, they can get away with raising premiums as much as they need. And administrative costs can be hidden. And this is something that you need to understand. In 2011, after passage of the Affordable Care Act, the insurance industry negotiated with the Obama administration to classify medical management as healthcare, not administration, for calculating how much of the healthcare premium goes to healthcare versus administration. So anything that they can call medical management, which is quality improvement, utilization management, payment reforms that are supposed to save money, all those things, they can stop classifying them as administrative costs and classify them as healthcare. Um, and this includes the cost of payment reforms that have the goals of assuring appropriate utilization, controlling costs, or improving quality of care. And all that matters is the stated goal, not the actual outcomes. It doesn't matter that almost all the recent innovations in medical management have resulted in increased costs, declining access to care, worse metrics. Uh, it doesn't matter that the effect is the opposite of the goal. As long as the goal is these things, they can call it healthcare, not administration. This is a study that showed if you calculate administrative costs the old way where medical management is administration, there has been no reduction in administrative costs by insurance companies since the Affordable Care Act. It has done nothing to slow the administrative overhead. They're just reclassifying as healthcare and playing games with their uh, accounting. So HMSA, <clears throat> HMSA, um, wait, hold on a sec. Did you lose screen sharing again? Oh, I am still screen sharing. Okay, looks like we're okay. The HMSA capitated primary care practices in Hawaii, and they tried to do it with all of them, although they weren't always able to include the hospital clinics uh, in 2017. And they then had a study that was published in Journal of AMA uh, in J July 2019 on the first year of this program, and they were looking for cost savings, improvement in quality, whether or not the program achieved the goals of payment reform. And they found out that there was... Uh, a substantial reduction in primary care visits, but the primary care doctors are paid a fixed amount per patient per month, whether they see the patient or not, so that saved no money. Slight increases in referrals to specialists, urgent care in the emergency room, and basically no difference in the total cost of care. And uh, they did have some improvement in quality metrics, but those met metrics capture maybe 2% of what doctors do, so I think they're of uh, limited meaning. And they, the study failed to mention medical management administrative costs for both the insurer and for doctors, which everyone on the ground knows increased substantially. This is a survey uh, done of Hawaii physicians at the end of 2019, just before the pandemic, a couple of years into the program. 80% felt it caused increase in administrative tasks. 42% reported reduced gross practice revenues plus increased overhead. 80% felt it contributed to worsening physician shortages. PT is payment transformation or capitation. And 80% would not recommend a new physician starting practice in Hawaii. And where we've been losing doctors rapidly, we're now a, a, a thousand doctors short for our population. So um, self-insuring Medicaid. Um, they, Medicaid, as you probably know, is a joint federal state matching funded program, roughly 50-50 in wealthier states, but there's some fund transfer from richer to poorer states. 
It's managed by the states who get to determine how the program is structured. And there's quite a bit of variability from state to state. Uh, there's temporary aid for needy families, Medicaid expansion population, and aged blind disabled, those who qualify for social security disability that are included in Medicaid. Starting in the mid nineties, states started turning Medicaid over to private insurance companies using section 1115 waivers. This, these are called MCOs, managed care organizations. Most started with aid for dependent children or temporary aid to need families and general assistance. And some have expanded to aged blind disabled. By 2017, two thirds of Medicaid recipients all over the country were under MCOs. The goals are supposedly budget predictability, save money, improve coordination and quality of care, more flexible benefits, network management, and improved payment schemes. Okay, 40 states contract at least, oh, no, we got this, all right. All right, the only states to implement Medicaid managed care using full risk health plans and then switch from that to self-insurance with primary care case management are Oklahoma and Connecticut, and both achieve significant savings. Um, primary care case management mean, means you pay primary care doctors extra to manage and coordinate care instead of hiring an insurance company to do that. You pay the doctors directly an extra fee and you enhance primary care pay and you say you coordinate care. They're in a much better position to do the, that because they know the patients. The insurance company obviously doesn't. Oklahoma achieved savings uh, and they also achieved an improved, significantly improved physician participation. And Oklahoma did primary care case management in part of the state and MCOs in part of the state. And they found that the primary care doctors were doing a lot better than the MCOs, so they fired the MCOs. Connecticut noted that experience and implemented uh, primary care case management throughout Medicaid in Connecticut in 2012. They also followed the lead of North Carolina, which developed the enhanced version of primary care case management with more community-based extra services for complex high-risk patients. Um, so Connecticut used the North Carolina model based on the experience of Oklahoma, and they kicked the insurance companies out and self-insured Medicaid and hired one of the former managed care plans as an administrative services only contractor in 2012. Prior to 2012, full risk Medicaid managed care organizations, the cost to Connecticut rose 45% over four years. That's over 10% a year. After 2012 and converting to an administrative services only contract, physician acceptance of Medicaid went up by somewhere around 25 or 30%. ER usage dropped 25%. Hospital admissions and readmissions dropped 6%. And six years later, per member, total Medicaid costs were 14% lower in 2018 than in 2012. And administrative costs were running 15 to 40% for the Medicaid MCOs. They run 12.5% for Connecticut commercial plans and they're now 2.8%, including the cost of the administrative services only contract. This is a much better result than anyone expected when they made this move to eliminate the managed care companies. No one knew there would be that much savings. And a lot of it was not just direct administrative costs or the cost of risk. It was also the fact that physician acceptance went up, you had more preventive care, better frontline care at, in the most cost-effective settings, resulting in lower ER and hospital costs. People ask, okay, but if you don't have managed care plans, who's gonna coordinate care? Who's gonna provide enhanced services? Uh, who's gonna do these community-based programs? Who's gonna do quality improvement? All those things can be funded directly on a non-risk basis by the state. You don't need to hire a middleman to do them. If there's an agency that can provide case management services for high-risk patients or a team-based care program that can do consultations on complex psychiatric problems, hire that agency directly. Why do you need a financial middleman to hire them? Hire them directly by the state. And that's what Connecticut did in their Medicaid program. Now in Hawaii, uh, as 
uh, you said in my introduction, as Stefan said in my introduction, uh, the Hawaii, Hawaii passed a law to create the Hawaii Health Authority in 2009, which is supposed to be responsible for overall health planning for the state and design a universal system covering everyone in the state. And uh, we had a Republican governor at the time who refused to implement the law, even though it was passed over her veto. And a few years later, we had a new governor, a Democrat who had been a supporter of single payer when he was our representative in the House. And he appointed the Hawaii Health Authority. And I was one of the original members. However, at the same time, the Affordable Care Act passed. And Governor Abercrombie had known Obama's parents when Obama was born. And he wanted Hawaii to be the flagship for implementing Obama's health care plan. So he pivoted, he threw us under the bus, took our funding that the legislature gave us, and turned to implementing the Affordable Care Act. He had no money in his budget to do that, so he went to the insurance companies for money, and they controlled the entire process. So we ended up being sidelined and, and not, not being able to implement any of the things that we recommended. So let's talk about what we would want to do, what we would still like to do if we could be activated and empowered. Uh, obviously, the goal is the universal system covering everyone. And single payer is the most cost effective way to do that. It gives you the lowest administrative costs and the most equity. All payer is another uh, idea, which basically is the same as what they do in many other European and some Asian countries, where you have multiple funding streams but you regulate them to require that they all have to offer the same thing, the same network of all uh, qualified providers, the same benefits, the same fees, the same payment system. So it allows multiple payers to exist, but it strips them of their insurance business model. This achieves about 90% of the cost advantages of single payer. So you can start by taking the components of the health system that are under state control, Medicaid, and employee and retiree benefits. Put them into a program where you have standardized fees, standardized payment, uh, a, a much simpler administrative structure, and you can achieve the kind of administrative savings single payer could achieve at the state level and provide a foundation for a full national single payer program if we can get it passed. And you can show the savings that are possible by focusing on administrative simplification and getting rid of the complexities of our payment system. So we won't get cost-effective healthcare from health plans whose business model rewards denial of care, avoidance of covering or paying for the sick and unnecessary micromanagement of care. We need universal coverage, remove the barriers to care in the most cost-effective settings, keep administrative simple and overhead costs low, stop sabotaging the expertise of doctors and driving them out of practice and eliminate micromanagement of doctors by insurance companies. There's a lot more detail I could get into and, and I'm open to questions. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Campbell. Um, yeah, thank you so much for bringing the Hawaii experience and also like referring here to Connecticut um, Medicaid or Husky as it's locally known here. and. Um, uh, yeah, giving us all of this information. So um, for questions, I already did see a question in the chat. Um, so I think it was about uh, the beginning. Yep, like, so what is the gaming of diagnoses? That means that if you have a patient admitted to the hospital and you are providing services and you have to you know, bill for that patient and you give the diagnosis code on the bill, you try to make the patient sound as sick as possible. So instead of uh, diagnosing pneumonia, you diagnose pneumonia with sepsis, which has a higher payment. If uh, an insurance company has a population of patients, they can send case managers around to doctor's offices, look at the charts and try to find more diagnoses that weren't included in the doctor's original bill, add them in so they can get a higher risk adjustment formula. So it's a way of making people look as sick as possible to collect more money. Oh, thank you. So that's, yeah, thank you for that explanation. Um, and then um, there was also a question regarding um, ERISA. So uh, for everybody who's not familiar with that, like, could you explain what does ERISA stand for? 
Employee Retirement Security Act of 1974. And it regulates employee benefits, both retirement benefits and health care benefits. And it says that if you have an, a large uh, national corporation that self-insures or a union that cu cuts across lots of states and they self-insure, that states cannot interfere with their health benefits. So that means any multi-state company that self-insures is, is exempt from state reforms. All right. As I said, the way around it is if the state establishes a, a system that covers everyone in the state and the, the, the employer, the multi-state employer wants to pay for health care twice, they can, but why would they? Yeah, yeah, of course, absolutely. So um, thank you so much for that, that we can get around ERISA um, in the way that you described. I, I really um, yeah, like that. Um, thank you so much for sharing that information. And I do see here several questions coming in about uh, gaming of the diagnoses. Like, so... Um, uh, basically asking like how is that legal um like sounds like adding um to people's medical records that travel with them everywhere they go afterwards to each hospital doctor that's correct and and uh traditionally physicians uh diagnosed what they felt was most relevant and all you needed was a diagnosis code and you could submit a claim the whole idea of paying more for certain diagnoses than other came about because of risk shifting if you push risk onto the doctors and say, we're gonna pay you a fixed amount per person, the doctor said, wait a minute, then I shouldn't take on any sick people. They say, okay, we'll pay you more for sicker people, but you need to give us detailed information on diagnoses so we know how much to pay you. So you code that person to be as sick as possible. It's sick. Wow, yeah. Um, this, so and this is pervasive in the Medicare Advantage program pervasive. There's lots of studies showing it. And it happens in Medicaid managed care also. And it happens whenever you have competing HMOs, ACOs, things like that. Yeah, um, seems to be very good illustrations that like ACOs, um, MCOs and something like that should not be part of the um, healthcare system or any single payer program. So um, yeah, so in order to um, have another question. I see Holly put herself in the stack here. Holly, please. Yes. May I please just ask you a quick question? Um, I also, for actually my paying job, um, I work for a mental health coalition, and I have been finding that there are especially a lot of extra mental health diagnoses, and even on my own personal medical record that I know I don't have. So I see these on my medical record and they travel with me because, you know, in Connecticut, we have the two evil empires, the Yale Health Plan and Hartford Healthcare, which, you know, I'm enrolled in both, but it travels with you to both. So I, you know, doctors, and it is true that a lot of doctors will treat people with mental health conditions completely differently for their physiological issues than their than they would a person who has no mental health diagnoses. So do they do this for mental health diagnoses as well? Yes, uh, there, there's always a problem with errors in diagnosis that get carried forward, which, which has always happened. And it, it's sometimes hard to get them corrected. And that, that's a, a problem that we should try to deal with. But now there is a financial incentive to do that, which has made it much worse. What happens is that that the state contracts with the managed care organization, which then subcontracts with the behavioral health contractor also capitated, then that organization has an incentive to upcode people and to make them as sick as possible, in addition to the primary contractor. So the state's getting hit twice with this incentive. I thank you for letting me know this. I did not know. And I will be certain to make sure that those in my coalition, if they are not aware, are aware of this because I certainly was not. And I've been around medical and mental health for quite some time. So I had absolutely no idea. So thank you so very much. The, the, the way to do this for mental, there, there are definitely specialized services for mental illness beyond what's uh, for regular care. Like you need special programs for the seriously mentally ill, you know, like day programs or clubhouses or 
uh, job retraining or things like that, and you need um, special programs for substance abuse. All of these should be funded directly by the state. I trained in psychiatry at Cambridge Hospital in the 70s, where the state said, here's the money, you take care of those things. And, uh, and there were no insurance companies involved. And I thought we did a really good job of trying to reach out and meet the needs of the community as best we could. And, uh, and, and it was a, an aspiring place to train. I, I value that model very much. Once they start putting middlemen in, the whole thing gets corrupted. And you end up with very poor access to care, lousy care, and the state is being told we're doing all these things to improve quality that aren't even reaching people. And it, it's all it is is a scheme to suck money out of the state. Um, yes, incredible. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I, I wanna say, I wanna say one <laughs> thing that came up in Michael Leidy's presentation about Kaiser. Because if you have, uh, if you want a cost-effective single-payer system, you want Kaiser doctors and you want Kaiser hospitals. And it's, it's fine and maybe desirable to have them closely integrated with each other. So when we talk about an integrated delivery system, it is not meant to exclude Kaiser doctors and hospitals working together. It's eliminating Kaiser corporate and the chain of hospitals uh, because the Kaiser corporate, which is the insurance functions and the empire building functions of Kaiser, those are purely parasitic to healthcare. You want to keep the doctors in hospitals and get rid of the corporate chain. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so there was one question here. Um, I have a very good Medicare Advantage plan. So United Stack Healthcare Dual Complete for people with both Medicare and Medicaid. So I pay, I pay virtually nothing. How can Medicare for all be better? Okay, the way Medicare Advantage works is the Medicare, the, the, the traditional Medicare program is full of holes. It has large patient co-pays. It has no max on out-of-pocket costs. It has a limited drug but, uh, uh, plan with a donut hole in it, which is gradually shrinking, but it was started as a huge donut hole. So there's lots of flaws in the coverage of regular Medicare. So traditionally there are Medicare supplement plans. And then they said, okay, uh, let's allow Med Medicare Advantage plans, which include medical, drug, and maybe some extra benefits. But those plans are risk-bearing entities and they compete for healthy people. They, they market to healthy people, to seniors who exercise and want gym memberships and things like that. They often have restricted formularies that don't cover expensive conditions. So the, people with expensive problems get driven back out of the plan. And so they're, they're actively cherry picking a healthy population and pu pushing the sick out. The reason they're able to do this is because of the flaws in traditional Medicare. If we were to improve Medicare benefits, instead of having 20% uh, copay and limited drug coverage, we covered everything 100%, which is what the national single payer proposals Jayapal's 1976 are all proposing, no deductibles and copays, expand the benefits to cover everything, include drug coverage. If we did all that, there would be no advantage to going with a Medicare Advantage plan and no reason for them to be sucking money out of the Medicare program. So they, it's a, it's a, they wanna keep Medicare crippled so they can exploit that to sell their products. It seems good when you have it, but you are definitely, the government is paying more for your care with Medicare Advantage than they would if you were in regular Medicare. All right. Yeah, that's a good explanation. And I see I'm um, also a raised hand here, Representative Susan Johnson. This, this was an absolutely fabulous uh, presentation. I really appreciate it. I learned uh, a lot from listening to you uh, and what has happened in Hawaii and how, how these things have changed uh, over the years. I did want to make one remark about the uh, Medicare uh, savings program because uh, you don't need to move uh, to the Medicare. The Medicare, you know, is divided into A, B, C, and D. And C is the Medicare Advantage program, which is the HMO program. Uh, A and B are regular, and D are regular parts of the Medicare program. And so for states like Connecticut, we have uh, contracted with the federal government for the Medicare savings program. Uh, the states that do create the programs in any way they see fit. 
Some of them have acid tests. I've been fighting to stop acid tests in these circumstances. And uh, so the people that just go by the straight income to be able to get the supplement to the Medicare without having to worry about buying a supplement, which can run a few hundred dollars a month, uh, in addition to the Part B premiums that you pay and the premiums for the Medicare Part D. Also, the formularies can change in between the period of time in which you contract or you enroll do your enrollment for the Medicare program. So those are just a few of the ideas uh, that would be good for other states uh, to be able to do. And I will continue to fight to stop the, <laughs> stop the uh, needling into the Medicare savings programs to make sure that the people in Connecticut and hopefully the rest of the country eventually will be able to uh, get those supplements based on their income. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, of course, that's um, something that might not be very well known, um, the Medicare Savings Program in Connecticut. So thank you so much for um, bringing that up here. Um, yes, so I see in the set here, chat here just saying that, um, thank you for an excellent presentation. I um, yeah, just wanted to uh, ask finally, um, we did hear about that, for example, in Hawaii, you were able to have the Hawaii um, Medical Society pass a Medicare for All resolution. So I wanted to ask about that. Is that true? And if so, how were you able to get that done? Yes, I, I've, been in, um, I've been a member of Hawaii Medical Association since I moved back there in 1985. And I'd been in a running dialogue on health policy with a couple of physician friends and a couple of other non-physicians for over a decade. And, uh, and I was the single payer advocate and I've been following the policy literature and things like that. So um, I submitted a resolution to the Hawaii Medical Association, which had been basically under Republican leadership for a decade. And I didn't expect anything to come of it. I just wanted to make them think. And they asked me to explain why and, and defend it, which I did. And to my amazement, the Hawaii Medical Association Council adopted the resolution. So we were the first branch of the AMA to get a resolution supporting single payer. And that led to getting my arm twisted to get involved in HMA politics. And a couple of years later, I was HMA president. And we had a succession of seven more presidents after who were all single payer supporters. So that, it was a real turning point. Wow, wow, amazing. Um, yeah, and then um, before we wrap it up here, I see Paul asking in the chat, um, Dr. Campbell, to your knowledge, um, do Medicare Advantage plans provided by large corporations for retirees lemon drop and cherry pick as well? Yes, there's, there's uh, quite a bit of policy literature on this that shows that they, they uh, sign up healthier than average seniors and they kick out sicker than average seniors systematically over time. So yes, they definitely cherry pick and lemon drop. Oh boy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, yeah, kind of like wrapping it up, we're nearly at nine o'clock, we just have a few more minutes, but um, uh, thank you so much everyone for this lively discussion. This was wonderful. And um, yeah, Dr. Campbell, one of the leading single payer policy experts in the nation, um, leader of the one payer states policy work group. Thank you so much. Um, this is incredible. Thank you for your time. Excuse me, Stefan, may I ask something? Yes. Um, is it possible for us, I don't want to bombard him, but to have a little more, have an email contact with him because I missed some of the stuff he said because I was trying to see stuff on the chat. Or should I contact you? There you go. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much. We appreciate you being with us, Dr. Campbell. You're welcome. All right. So um, I see um, just for Medicare for All Connecticut, um, I think Pete had to leave us. Um, of course, there was already pasted in the chat all of our upcoming activities. I was wondering, is there somebody um, for the resolutions who could speak about um, the Hamden events? I see. Holly, are you able to speak about that? Well, I will be part of the canvassing on Sunday and Pete did put in a link for canvassing on Sunday as well. Um, he, he did it right before he left. We're doing phone banking, but canvassing 
on Sunday here, it's Sunday in Hamden. Um, so, oh, I'm having trouble copying and pasting it, but Pete posted it right before he left. Um, and uh, myself and Alana and Dana, uh, we meet at 1235 Whitney Avenue. I believe it's, it is a bookstore, but I can't remember. I think it's Never Ending Books, I believe. Um, and we'll be doing canvassing there. Company, company Holly. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry, Suzanne. Thank you so much. That's right. I live down the street. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, here's Pete's, Pete, here's the information for canvassing in Hamden. Um, you know, we have a lot of fun. I, I like meeting people and talking to people and, and, you know, really telling them what we're trying to accomplish and how much money they could save for their for their town and um, what programs could be um, instituted if they could save three mills um, because that's what it would be in Hamden is three mills on their tax rate um, is exactly what they would save if a Medicare for all resolution was instituted. Um, I believe it's like $80 million or something like that. Um, so it, it's, it's a significant amount of money um, and, you know, you don't really need to be trained. You just, you have a passion for this and you speak your truth, which is that you would believe in Medicare for all. Um, and that's all you need. And we give you all the tools that you need to canvas with us and come out and enjoy some, get your steps in and have fun with us. Get to know your neighbors. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so that's gonna be on Sunday. Um, and uh, I was asked also, like, um, do we have any other updates? I mean, I know we're nearly at nine o'clock, but from any other committees, um, we have those committees, for example, communications. Okay, all good. Um, uh, and yeah, so just about one of some of the upcoming also activities outside of Medicare for All Connecticut. Um, we did speak about um, Wednesday, phone banking, that's tomorrow, 6 p.m., Sunday. Um, canvassing in Hamden, join Holly and Alana and everyone. Um, just like she said, get your steps in, get to know your neighbors. And um, yeah, just uh, also we wanna um, recognize here that um, One Payer States, um, the organization that also Dr. Campbell is active in as chair of the policy work group um, is having an event um, just one week from today. So that's next Tuesday, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Um, it's about how do we communicate, for example, with um, conservatives, it's about messaging. So um, very great um, presenters here, very great speakers on that. Um, and then also, of course, there's Physicians for National Health Program. They are informing about another issue that um, the traditional Medicare is kind of like silently privatized through a process here called direct contracting entities. So a presentation on that is going to take place on Thursday of next week at 9 p.m. Eastern. This is um, another virtual presentation. Um, also, Physicians for National Health Program is having their annual meeting in virtual form now, so you don't have to travel anywhere where you can participate from home. Um, this is open to both physicians and non-physicians. Um, so here's the information uh, for October 22nd and October 23rd, um, PNHP, Physicians for National Health Program, annual meeting. So that's the organization that also Dr. Campbell is um, board member with um, and active in Hawaii. So um, then of course there's National Nurses United. Um, they have three activities coming up. Um, one is kind of um, informing about CVS and how CVS is trying to stop Medicare for all. So um, there's an action around that on September 18th, which is um, just this week. Then there's uh, they have uh, Medicare for all postcarding parties on October 5th, October 7th, October 10th. So if you want to send postcards for Medicare for all, um, that's going to be your event here with National Nurses United. And then uh, finally, they do have uh, Medicare for all phone banks into their target districts where uh, US reps uh, are like being asked now to co-sponsor Medicare for all and their specific ones that would be very beneficial to get on board. So um, all of that is just the announcement part here is National Nurses United, One Pair of States, PNHP, about um, upcoming activities. At this point, any other um, thoughts, questions, comments? Uh, yes. Um, 
how is this information about these upcoming events uh, accessible to us? Or will they come in emails from you? Or can I get access the Zoom thing for these different events that I might like to participate in? Uh, absolutely, um, there's going to be an email. So uh, tomorrow you're going to receive an email which contains all of the information from the guest speakers, um, these presentations, as well as also all the upcoming activities. Excellent, thank you. But And I will also somehow want to get more information in my hands or on my, on my screen um, to help me be able to speak with Murphy and De Deloro in the not too distant future. I know that I think I was at a town hall with Murphy and he's still stuck to his own plan. Yes, um, US Senator Murphy, um, that's great, like reaching out to him to ask him to uh, co-sponsor Medicare for all. So definitely we can provide you with information about that. Thank you. It was really excellent. I thank you for putting it together, whoever was involved. Thank you, thank you so much. And any other uh, comments, thoughts, questions? I know we're kind of at the nine hour mark, so if somebody has to drop off, no problem. Just wanted to open up the floor. I think the question was asked, when is the next, uh, when are the committee meetings? Um, do we have dates and times set yet for committee meetings? Uh, yes, we do. And so um, everybody who is interested in joining the committees also don't hesitate, for example, to uh, reach out to us to put uh, even just your name and your email address in the chat or something and then which committees you're interested in we can get in touch with you so um the electoral and legislative work group is going to have its meeting tomorrow at 7 15 pm and then we just have the time set here for the outreach committee um that's going to be on thursday september 30th from 8 to 9 pm and for the fundraising committee on Tuesday, September 21st, 8.30 till 9.30 p.m. And I think if I remember it correctly, um, yeah, we also have the communications committee, which is on the first Tuesday of every month at 6 p.m. Yeah, I'm not looking to join a com committee necessarily. I'm quite active in a variety of things, but I do want to go to something which will, like tonight, inform me better. So I said, when I came in, I wasn't sure if I was still gung-ho for Medicare for All. I'm definitely back on board with exclamation points. Wonderful, wonderful. Suzanne, it was great like meeting you like back then when we originally did and yeah wonderful thank you for joining us again now here virtually and, and looking forward to kind of continuing being in contact yes all right any additional questions comments thoughts can you make sure i have your email stefan in case i want to email you some questions yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to send you an email afterwards. We were like emailing a little bit back then, prior to the pandemic. Um, yes. In person, New Haven Medicare for All meetings, but yeah, absolutely. And um, it's nice to meet Amanda. Is she with uh, the two other ladies in Washington? Amanda? I am actually in Hamden, um, and I'm just a designer by day, and I volunteer as the co-chair of the communications committee. Oh, I see. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. We're in the same town. Yeah, Hamden. Hey, Ham I like Hamden. We'll be interesting to find out who's going to be our mayor tomorrow. I haven't followed the results. Yet. Yes, that's going to be exciting. I, I voted for a certain person, but my prayer was then that the best person for the job would win, regardless of it, whether it was the one I voted for. <laughs> Yes, we will see tomorrow. I'm looking forward to it. So, yeah. yeah, if I have time, Holly, I'll drop by books and company. Uh, but I, I'm hesitant to get on a committee. I'm at the cusp of beginning to do too much. And I got to watch that because it's not good for my mental well-being. 
Yes. Make sure to take care of yourself. Sometime, There's many ways to get involved. Sometime, Holly, I want to ask you a question, but not not publicly. I understand. I, I will I give you some my input email. way back when, and I wondered yes. if it helped. Okay. I will send you my email right now. Thank you. Good to yeah. see you. You look well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me do that right now before I forget and before the meeting is ended. Oh, there you are. Okay, I'll send it to you right now before the meeting is ended. Thank and you. And it's nice to see you. Same thing. All right. So unless I hear any other thoughts, questions, comments, I just want to say once again, thank you so much, everyone. This was fantastic. Thank you so much for joining and uh, keep your eyes open for an email tomorrow with all the follow-up information. Yes, thank you everyone for joining and coming to the meeting. We appreciate it. Yes, thank and you. I just want to uh, hold off until Holly, were you able to send an email? Okay. Did you write it down, Suzanne? Uh, Holly, H1133 at gmail.com. And I didn't write it That's down correct. yet, but I read it. Okay. All right. Probably All not. Right. Tonight. Probably not tonight. All right. No it's not critical. I'm just always curious. Okay. No about problem. many things. Okay. But no I'm not problem. a cat. Okay. No. <laughs> I wish you had nine lives, though. I could use them sometimes. I understand. I've already used two, so I get you 100%. <laughs> oh, goodness. How many people did we have on this? 39. Oh, wonderful. I think 39. At one point. <laughs> Pardon? I think it was 40 at one point. Oh, wow. Take the top number and use it. Nice round number. Yeah. Great job, everyone. Good job. Thank you all for being here. And great job to everyone who Good put night. their hard work in. Great. All right. Stay safe, everyone. Thank okay. you. Thank Stay you. safe. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. You guys, too. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.